reverse discrimination acceptable? Because for many years, there has been discrimination against women. But is the answer reverse discrimination in the workplace? Because it is running in the workplace uh, very much. It, it goes on quite a bit in the workplace now. And I would say that if, if, in, in terms of the sexes, uh, women have got equal opportunity. Uh, women are overrepresented, as Robert said, in universities, except they're represented in every single discipline, overrepresented uh, except in the STEM, you know, the hard sciences. Uh, and, and in some of the humanities, they're, they're sometimes up to 70, 80, or 90 percent women. Uh, once women have the educational background, and the opportunities, and once there is no discrimination against them, I personally do not understand. I, I know I once did a study of, uh, for example, the city of Toronto's, um, uh, their civic offices. Uh, their human resource department was 100% women. Uh, they, they simply do not, uh, they don't hire men. They don't want to and they don't. Uh, and most of the, I looked at all, every, every civic department in Toronto, and uh, the best I could come up with in some was 50-50, but most of them are uh, more, uh, because our hiring part policies are, are the, all governments are, are include women as amongst disadvantaged groups, along with you know visible minorities and indigenous peoples and all that, but they are not disadvantaged, and in some cases they are over-advantaged. No, I don't understand why, uh, but it just continues anyways. That doesn't answer your question, but I'm, I'm agreeing with you. <laughs> I think one way to look at it is in terms of the importance of the concept of diversity, and that includes male culture. So if in psychology where 80% are now female, uh, I think it's a huge problem for the profession. There's a loss of intellectual diversity, of cultural diversity. It's an impoverishment of the field, and I think it needs to be seen as a crisis. Implicit in um Reverse discrimination is the expectation that if we give equal opportunity to people, there will be automatically a mathematically equal result. And, you know, the analogy I like to give is that, you know, if you go out to dinner at a restaurant with friends and everybody has the same menu, they don't all order the same meal. Historically, women were discriminated against. Now, this is no longer the case. And I think there are certain fields, as you say, you know, I've taught psychology classes here at McGill that are not 80% female, they're 100% female. Um, and so it, 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 I wouldn't say it's a problem, but it's not really identified commonly as a problem, whereas in STEM areas, they consider it to be something that should be redressed. So that, I would say, relates to your uh, comment about double standards. Well, just to say that uh, to protect uh, women's rights doesn't mean to uh, disregard uh, or not take care of the women's uh, problems that, as you have seen, they exist and they are very important. I just a question about the, what was mentioned about the confrontational approach to a collaborative approach because to the same problem, there's often academic discourse offering different explanations. For example, women's over overrepresentation in higher education has been argued by feminist, radical feminist scholars as due to wage uh, differences. It's because men have less wage differences, they don't feel the need to complete school. So uh, how will we, we be able to arrive, perhaps, at a collaborative approach where uh, you know, academic discourse-wise or policy-wise we can actually work together instead of you know, even in academia, we are battling it out on um, why these problems occur, wh whether from a feminist perspective or from a man's mental health perspective. I agree that it shouldn't be confrontational, that it should be a collaboration. I really support Teresa's point of view. Uh, but I would say that we have to start with the evidence and go from the evidence. And because science is a you know, constantly evolving endeavor, the evidence continues to change. So the discussion should change along with the evidence. So for example, um, obviously it was a very sticky concept, the neurochemical imbalance explanation for depression, and it, and it hit people in a way that they could understand it. 
And now that if the evidence is not supporting it, we have to look for other evidence that really makes a lot of sense. So my answer to your question is I, I'm, I think we start with the data and move from there and hope that we can achieve consensus about the facts. There were some comments made about discrimination toward women being something of the past. And I understand that in some fields, it's almost 100% women. Or, and in others, there's still that, uh, that there's still a minority. So comment one is, you know, I, I, would, I wonder uh, how that, you know, the idea that discrimination toward women is a thing of the past would be considered, especially for people of color and people who are from visible minority groups who continue to face some discrimination. Um, and then the other part of it would be based on, you know, programs and different um, educational, uh, you know, professional um, programs, um, what accounts for that difference? Um, and, you know, when we look at one specific program, does that, ex that doesn't obviously explain everything. So I'm just wondering, like, you know, has it been looked into in terms of the why? Like, and just to give a bit of background as well, I did my medical training in uh, at the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg, and uh, we definitely were not women were definitely not the majority, and uh, people of color were definitely the minority. And um, uh, I did my psych I'm doing my psychiatry training currently at the University of Ottawa, so I do feel that there are some differences probably in representation from place to place and program to program, but I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that based on this conversation. Um, I'd like to say something about that because I, I, I have looked into some statistics on this kind of thing, and I, I, I think it's not a good idea always to uh, assume that correlation is causation. If, if there are some minorities that are not represented uh, in, in certain fields uh, commensurate with their, with their numbers in the population, that can be lack of interest. Uh, that can be a uh, lack of uh, uh, numbers of people going, numbers of, of, of women getting educated in general from that population or, or in sciences, whatever. Uh, I don't think I would, looking at the po positive, for example, uh, the status of women Canada, their latest report, actually shows, for example, that Muslim women uh, were being told that they were not represented. You know, uh, there, were, there were Muslim organizations saying, well, Muslim women are suffering because they're not represented in their numbers or they're not, they're being discriminated against. Status of women actually looked at the population. It turns out that they are absolutely commensurate in their numbers, in representation in the different fields with uh, other women from, you know, uh, other or heritage Canadians with everybody else. I, I think you tend to say, oh, there aren't, this particular minority is not, in, is not, represented in this stream or this domain or this uh, that must be discrimination but it doesn't have to be discrimination and I I resist uh, always I, I, I think we should always look at other factors first uh, and and look for proof of discrimination because I actually think uh, systemically across Canada especially in government jobs uh, universities there has been a tremendous pr push to bring forward and to to uh, equalize that situation in terms of minorities, and it has been extremely successful. Um, so instead of looking for areas, you know, I don't think that assumption should be made that it's discrimination. I think there could be many factors. You know, I just, uh, you know, perhaps you were echoing a comment that I made that said that historically women were discriminated against, but I didn't mean to imply that discrimination no longer exists. I, I didn't mean to apply that, so I'm sorry if I left that impression. Um, but I will say that nationally in Canada, more than 60% of incoming medical students are female. So in terms of, I actually don't like to play the numbers game. But if we are going to play the numbers game, women are disproportionately affected in medicine, and especially in certain fields, particularly in Quebec, that are more, as they say, valorisé, like family medicine. Okay, so. I think, it, as, as Barbara points out, I think it's um, a complex stew. Discrimination could definitely play a role, but women's interests could play a role as well. And there's a very rich and varied um, research 
field devoted exactly to this. Um, and so if you're interested, I encourage you to get in touch with me and I'll send you some articles. Yeah, uh, in, in my system definitely there's still discrimination against women or maybe against families. At my medical school, 6% of the professors were female. And uh, 30 years back when they were students, it was certainly not the case that only 6% of the medical students were women. Um, but uh, actually my main question was on these happiness uh, data you mentioned. Um, if there was any work done looking into how um, men and women maybe have different anchors on these scales because I uh, just thought of some research done concerning um, heterosexual sexual encounters or dates and what would be a bad date, like the uh, worst uh, a man could imagine what it might be boring, I might pay more than I expect to, and a woman uh, might think I might get raped and killed. So maybe um, men have also, as, as you mentioned, they are more willing to die on their job, so maybe they have a tendency to go all the way, and so maybe they have a higher expectation of what happiness should be, and so they don't see themselves attaining that 100%, so they report lower. Um, they uh, lower uh, actual value of happiness and women don't have high expectations, maybe that's just some idea, so was any uh, consideration put into that, like how these scales work out for both genders? I, I think it's very true that men and women, when you look at the research on what men and women expect out of their work lives and how they shoot, make occupational choices, um, there are different value systems, and it's very clear. And the research that you should look at is by um, uh, Camilla Banbo from Vanderbilt University, and David Lubinsky, and Harrison Kell, where they essentially have followed a group of gifted and talented teenagers, and they're now in their 40th year of a follow-up study. These are people who are in the top 1% of science and math achievement as teenagers and on achievement scales, and every few years they come back and see how they're doing and what choices they've made. And they did a really interesting study that was published in 2014 where there were not only major differences in occupational choices, but there were major differences in values and what they considered to be success. So men were more likely to say, well, you know, my ideas have value and uh, I deserve to be recognized for my ideas. Uh, women were more likely to say, I want to work in a job where equality and fairness is a value and where I work with people I respect. And some of these values sort of diverted them, even though they were of equal ability, into different types of work with, for example, many more women going into um, health professions and many more men going into things like engineering and IT. Um, and men valued much more concrete achievement, much more highly, and women valued, I guess, how to, how to paraphrase it, equality and fairness much more than the men did. I mean, so there are differences in values that come up when you follow up with people who have been evaluated to be, on a certain level anyway, absolutely equivalent. Another aspect is that you can study how men and women in each of those professional groups are approaching those jobs and what they do value because there's more variability within women than between men and women. So if you look at variability of personality style and so forth, there's more variability happening within the gender. So women differ from each other enormously and we sometimes lose that and treat women as though they are homogeneous in their approaches and attitudes and values and it's far from true. So in the study I did with the paramedics where about half the respondents were male, half were female, it was quite intriguing that they each coded themselves as just as resilient, but they did it in different ways. So the men were stronger in terms of forgiving themselves, being self-compassionate and so forth, and women had much more of an issue with that, judging themselves very harshly. Uh, the men were much weaker in terms of having social support networks. So you had some real differences in how they were coping and approaching <coughs> that area. But by actually studying men and women in these different jobs, maybe in the STEM professions, what kind of women are attracted to that? What are the values and attitudes and approaches and strengths those women have? Do we want more women in STEM? Then we need to cultivate those values and attitudes in women 
and encourage that proportion of women who might have been really unhappy outside of that field. Uh, similar with men in the health professions, what kind of men really want to be in, in the helping professions? What's different about them? I have to say, I don't understand this drive uh, that there's something wrong in a profession when it's not equally made up of men and women. Uh, why should we want to encourage more women to go into STEM if they don't already want to go into it? Nobody encouraged women to go into uh, veterinary studies. Veterinary studies used to be 99% male, and there was no affirmative action for women. There was no push. There was nobody saying, oh my god, there's not enough people in veterinary science. Well, veterinary science is now, the, the schools of veterinary science, which are very difficult to get into, harder than to get into a lot of medical schools because there's not so many of them, is 80% women with no intervention whatsoever. Let people do what they want. They have, if you've got the marks, you can do what you want today. And Nobody is forcing women to say, oh, we have, to, we have no women in the sewers. We have to get women you know, to, to get into sewer work. I don't understand why this, this push to get women into the higher and into the more satisfying and into the more rewarding professions. If you're perfectly comfortable having uh, the hazardous pr 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 professions, the dirty professions, the, the disgusting professions, 100% male. So it strikes me as kind of ludicrous that we're always moaning over uh, the lack of women in STEM as if there were some kind of active discrimination against them. There is not. They try very hard to get them in. They don't want to be in it. So why, why, are, we, why are we flogging this horse? Sorry. One of my pet peeves. Yes, um, I am Consuelo and I work here at McGill. Um, this question is for uh, Dan. One clarification. Um, your presentation, it's um, global figures or is Canadian uh, population? Oh, uh, the data I was using was Canadian. Canadian. Um, we know that the um, uh, Aboriginal peoples here in Canada have a very high suicide rate. So I would assume that in your presentation, uh, the, the, the whole population is lumped together. Would you be able to Tell us a little bit about the difference between the Aboriginal suicide rates and mental health problems versus the general population. Well, of course they're much higher, but I know that much. I haven't looked into it in detail in terms of in, you know, Aboriginal, Indigenous men versus women. Uh, I believe I've seen some statistics showing that Indigenous men again, are far more at risk than Indigenous women, but I, I haven't looked into it in detail. I would have to really uh, explain What that. I was thinking is uh, Aboriginal men versus, you know, the, the general men population uh, of Canada? Just from, from what I've seen, I assume they'd be far more at risk. And would you have any idea what's, you no, know? No, I, I don't have the data. I'd have to go back and track that down. I'm sure it exists. I'm sure it's been looked at in terms of relative risk. Um, I've done a little bit of research on mental health and mental illness stigma, um, mostly to do with cross-cultural research, but um, it struck me uh, when you, the first speaker read it, when you put the list up of, you know, here are the problems that we're seeing, these big gender ratios where they affect men more, it struck me, this was this is the list of the unpopular disorders, and then the ones that are stigmatized in a particular way, they're stigmatized for being uh, not, not the most dangerous and scary, that tends to be the psychosis, but the ones where there's a sort of a moralistic element to it, where this is, the person is making a bad decision, and that's why we have the disorder. So they are choosing to be angry, they're choosing to drink. All that this person would have to do is stop drinking and the disorder would go away, or all they'd have to do is not dive into swimming pools without water in them and their spines would be okay. And I wonder whether there's something about the disorders that are more common in men, that they're sort of, that they're easy to dismiss as being there's something kind of problematic about male decision making. Something about male men have agency, but they're using their agency for bad somehow. And it's leading to bad outcomes. And it's hard to sympathize with someone like that who's just drinking despite the fact that it's wrecking their family. But schizophrenia can wreck your family too, but we don't see the person as choosing to be psychotic. And so we might we might stigmatize them because the disorder scares us, but not because there is someone 
sort of behind the disorder, making a, a morally problematic choice. And I just wonder if you could comment on whether that makes it more difficult to raise sympathy for male health concerns, mental health concerns. Well, one of the first things you learn when you're doing psychotherapy is to conceptualize the concept of choice in a very different way. So I may be working with, I think of the hospital, or I might be working with a woman who is going back to an abusive relationship, and I would say, he's going to kill you. And she would be going back. And if I just saw it as a choice, I'd be horrified by her choice. I might feel morally condemning of her choice. It's, it's absurd, it's insane. But if I look at who she is, who she's been made by her experiences, by the cultural values that she's in, I can say, I see, why, I see why you're doing this. It's horrible, it's tragic. I'm going to try to change that, but I see where this is coming from, and I can see where it's going, and it's, it's pretty awful. Same thing with any kind of choice. There's the aspect of somebody who is choosing, and there are people who are caught in their patterns of coping, which is really what I work with. You're caught, you've learned a pattern of coping, you're suffering from it. You don't necessarily even conceptualize that as a choice. You don't experience freedom in that regard. You experience facticity. You experience yourself as driven to that, as having no options. So men who are caught in that drinking relieves my suffering cycle, where the drinking then contributes to further suffering and so forth. The concept of choice has become really complicated. Yeah. And for me to make a moral judgment, you just have to stop drinking, you're doing this terrible stuff, uh, becomes really difficult. I don't feel comfortable making the moral judgment because I can see how this person is so caught up in a pattern right. that that they're harming themselves, they're doing things, but it's not it's not a free choice. So thinking is so as a clinic as a clinician, I completely agree with you. I wonder about um, what we do with that that perspective in terms of communicating with the public. Because I think that the difficulty is not necessarily that you and I working with certain kinds of clients would have this curved notion of choice that I was alluding to before. But rather that say uh, granting agency or humanitarian agency or a public funder or someone doing a news story on CBC or something like that may be coming at the problem with this perspective that there seems to be a, you know there's a lot of men being aggressive let's say or like male aggression is a problem but it, and female depression is a problem but it maybe is a difference in terms of seeing one problem as being Oh, it's a thing that happened to the depressed person, but it's a thing that the aggressive person is doing. Yeah, but even in, in depression, part of the argument for using a neurochemical imbalance theory is that it takes that moral judgment onus off the person, and they can say, well, it's just a disease they've got. We need to feel empathic for them. We need to be compassionate because they've got this terrible physical disease. And that was portrayed as the alternative to one that was shaming and blaming and so forth for that person. And my argument has been, not just that you have a lack of data for this view, but there are actually other viewpoints. And one of them is, you are caught up in a learned and compulsive pattern of coping that is causing you misery. We need to help you change the pattern. It's not just that you're choosing to act in these terrible ways, it's that you actually have a limited degree of freedom in that situation because of the coping patterns you've learned and been caught up in. So if you've been raised by a parent who constantly and brutally criticized you, and you do what many people do, which is internalize that as a way of speaking to themselves in their own minds and become severely depressed, that's a pattern they have to bring out. When you show it to them, people are often startled to realize, one, that they're doing it, two, how brutally they're speaking to themselves in a way they would never speak to someone else, that there is an option and that is inappropriate and unfair to themselves, and that when they start to change it, they emotionally start to feel better. So when you get someone through that experiment, if you like, and they see it, their freedom increases. And it very much becomes like that existential situation, the tension between freedom and facticity that we're always in. You open up more, much more freedom, and the person actually starts to have choice.